Okay, I think we'll get started, if we could, so we have plenty of time for question and discussion. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. And we're delighted today to welcome uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chief Ojo Madweke, um, and his delegation from Abuja. They were here for our marvelous inauguration, and um, I'm very glad you, you could be here for that. It was quite an inspiration here in Washington, and I hope around the world. Um, I want to say uh, welcome uh, Ambassador Obiozoar as well. Uh, and I want to say thanks to Dave Hennick for helping organize this um, event on, on quite short notice and to all of you for coming. Uh, just to begin, I think this is a very important opportunity uh, and moment uh, going forward, an opportunity to re-energize U.S.-Nigeria relations. Um, we're in the midst in the Africa program um, of completing a review of Africa policy uh, during the Bush administration with um, recommendations for the Obama administration. And one of the themes through that is, is the idea that U.S.-Nigeria engagement um, has been neglected, I think, particularly at a senior diplomatic level. Um, obviously, we, our, our view is that this should not be the case. Um, it's such an important partner important to the U.S. directly, but also important for its regional impacts uh, and leadership, um, African leadership and, uh, and global leadership as well. Part of this is on the U.S. side. I think global crises um, and crises within Africa have, have sapped diplomatic attention. There's been something of a perception, I think very short-sighted, that the market uh, will take care of, of oil uh, supplies and that the crisis in, in the Delta while on occasion it's marginally bumped up global prices, it hasn't really reached a level that requires a much more vigorous and robust response and a much more consistent dialogue with the leadership in Abuja. Our view is that, in fact, the crisis is, is worsening over time, um, and uh, it's something that's become much more international in its impact. And there are, are these are things, I think, that we, we hope the new administration will take up, and that uh, comes out in, in the review a number of times. Uh, but also, I think there's a perception here in Washington uh, that there's a great deal of uncertainty uh, hanging over Nigeria. Uh, the court cases, m many of which have been resolved, internal dynamics and politics within Nigeria are kind of drawing the country inward in some ways. Uh, and while there are a lot of stated priorities and goals in Nigeria, it's very hard, at least from Washington, uh, to sitting here in Washington, to discern the strategy and the vision um, that Nigeria has for its role in Africa and its role uh, globally. Uh, so what we're hoping, I think, that you can do today is, is help us understand what is the narrative and what is the vig vision uh, for Nigeria's role in the region, for its engagement with the U.S., uh, for tackling the crisis in the Delta, and for uh, addressing the many challenges within Nigeria. I think there are many in this room who are very eager for much greater engagement with Nigeria uh, and ready to push the new administration uh, to a much more robust, consistent dialogue. Uh, people here um, who are very ready to help identify and seize opportunities for greater collaboration. And I think that's, that, too, is where you can be helpful today. Uh, just to introduce our speaker, um, I think many of you know him, but Minister Madwekwe was uh, trained as a lawyer and started out in private practice, but he has a long career of political and public service. Uh, he was an elected senator. He's been Minister of Tourism, Minister of Transportation. He's been a legal and constitutional advisor to President Obasanjo. He was National Secretary of the People's Democratic, Republic, uh, People's Democratic Party, PDP and sworn in in July 2007 as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Your Excellency, welcome uh, today. I think, as I said, I think this is a, a great moment to be here, and we're looking forward to your talk and, and to discussion afterwards. Jennifer, thank you very much. Friends, uh, distinguished guests, I must say I feel very humbled to have this podium this morning. Uh, one doesn't need to be a scholar or 
a policy maker or indeed a politician uh, to appreciate the important role of this uh, famous and a venerable uh, institute in shaping policies in uh, <clears throat> identifying uh, new directions and getting the context and, and content of so much uh, that happens. Um, one of the lines in uh, President Obama's very powerful inaugural speech um, that caught my special attention. Everything there caught my attention, but there was something there that caught my special attention was uh, <clears throat> when echoing St. Paul in the New Testament. He said, let, let us put, put aside childish things. Let us put aside childish things. It's like the president was saying, it's time to get into a more adult conversation. Uh, that reference by President Obama resonated with me, uh, not only because of uh, my universe that was shaped by being the son of a Presbyterian pastor, where, of course, St. Paul was a favorite any day. But I have been concerned uh, that the wonderful opportunities that exist uh, in the relationship between the United States and all of Africa, and I would say particularly Nigeria, you know, there is need to upgrade those prospects there's need to, using the word, the description of this institute, there's need to make them more strategic. And I think more strategic is perhaps the secular version of uh, President Obama's uh, biblical metaphor of saying, let's put aside uh, childish things. I was also thrilled when I had my television on at the time when the new Secretary of State, uh, who definitely is neither a new face to Washington, uh, you know, a stranger to foreign policy, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, as she was being received by her staff yesterday, uh, she talked about the three pillars of U.S. Uh, national security doctrine and said that two out of those pillars belong to the job she will be doing the next uh, uh, couple of years. She was referring to development and diplomacy. Well, the other third leg, defense, belongs to uh, the Department of Defense. So putting together what the President said about let's put aside childish things, and what the Secretary of State said about development and diplomacy, that to me had summarized the emphasis, the particular emphasis I want to bring to the issues I would like to uh, share with you this morning. I am tired, and I'm sure many of you are also tired. Yeah. We, can be, we can all collectively feel uh, both sick and tired of <coughs> having Nigerian ministers come to gatherings like this 
and say, we are the largest country in Africa. We are 140 million people. Uh, no country ever got a reward for a demographic. <laughs> I'm sure you are tired of being told about how much oil um, your nationals uh, dig under our feet and then they count the money. Uh, actually, what we think we are getting out of it is what they tell us after the counting. I'm not sure we are perfected ourselves even how to do the counting. So they count the money and give us and then they ship the oil to you. And at the end of the month, we gather in Abuja, local government, state government, and the federal government. We share the money. 70% uh, of it goes into salary, which means that we share it among ourselves, the elite. We pay ourselves salary, and about 30% goes into capital expenditure. Um, you are tired, you are sick and tired of hearing that. We too are getting sick and tired of talking about that. I uh, started developing this sense of fatigue about the kind of statistics we normally come out from Nigeria. Large population, oil reserves. Um, when I, um, for those of you from Nigeria who may feel a little bit embarrassed by my talking this way, uh, I'm always trying to remind myself I'm the uh, number one diplomat in Nigeria, but it's often a hard thing for me to fully internalize. So don't mind my speaking the way I feel, because if we cannot be honest with ourselves here, then uh, it's a waste of time. I was, uh, I was visiting the Singaporean stand uh, in Hanover, in World Expo in Hanover in uh, 1999, and the Singaporeans saw us coming to the stand about <coughs> seven ministers. Uh, you couldn't mistake who we were, but we were all wearing the Nigerian national dress, the, the big thing, you know. Uh, it's because of the Washington coal, that's why I'm not wearing my own this morning, because I love that dress. And. Uh, the Singaporeans didn't try to be diplomatic at all. As soon as they saw us, they said, you are from Nigeria, we said yes. And they were boasting the fact that they didn't have oil in Singapore. And they told us that uh, what they had uh, was knowledge uh, which had enabled them to create uh, the, the things that have made Singapore so important. What am I alluding to in some of these uh, fairly rebellious remarks? Nigeria has turned the corner. Nigeria is tired of just being uh, a country of natural resources and um, not rising up to its true potential. Our most important asset is the enterprise of our people the entrepreneurship of our workforce, the dynamism and creativity of the Nigerian population. And I'm sure that many of you who have met Nigerians, uh, not only here in the United States, but uh, anywhere in the world, you can testify to what I'm saying. Uh, Nigerians can be accused of virtually any other thing, but not, they can be accused of being lazy. Uh, they kind of be accused of lacking in ingenuity. Sometimes that ingenuity can be a source of embarrassment. We therefore believe that the Obama election provides an extraordinarily powerful new window of opportunity for engagement. And for the foreign minister of a country like Nigeria to have said several times since November 4, and I wish to say it again here, 
that the Obama election has denied us uh, the political elite in Africa of every excuse uh, for continuing failure. We have run out of excuse. There was a time when the excuse was uh, colonialism. Uh, when that didn't quite work, we've, we've got another word, neocolonialism, imperialism, um, Somewhere along the line, uh, we we were talk we talked about the unequal uh, nature of uh, of trade relations. Uh, there is no limit to what excuses can be offered uh, when people are not ready to take responsibility. And the way Obama emerged as president of the United States by simply doing better than every other candidate has a powerful symbolism for us in Africa, particularly in Nigeria, that yes, we can. That yes, we can means putting our house in order on the issues that create an enabling environment for competitiveness, the rule of law issue, uh, democratic consolidation, fighting corruption. And so, the kind of relationship we want to see with the United States is one that has become a more adult relationship in which you don't assume that we don't understand democracy and so you want to start taking us back to kindergarten lessons on democracy. We are sick and tired of that. Or you think we don't know what rule of law is, so you want to take us through all that again. Or you made up your mind that we are very comfortable with corruption, and so you want to give us lectures as to who should even be appointed to the offices in fighting corruption. That kind of approach will not work with us. And the reason why it will not work is not as a result of some atavistic return to an outmoded form of nationalism. It will not work because there is already a clear consensus in Nigeria on these issues. So we have to now move from generalities to specifics. That is the nature of relationship we want now with the United States of America. If in the area of the economy, for instance, uh, what is it that if it's done by both countries will create the environment that can ensure that the fairly impressive rate of uh, economic growth that has been registered in the past nine years does not slack because of the current global economic crisis? but it's sustained. We can talk about that. And here, what is required is a leap of imagination by a major development partner like the United States of America. Unless there's a big infrastructure push in Nigeria, especially in the area of power, uh, the best resolutions or best um, agendas for getting the economy of Nigeria moving uh, will be difficult to, to sustain. So here, we're not asking you to leave your problems in America and uh, bring command and uh, bring your resources to, to us. But there's a linkage here. As you stim uh, stimulate the U.S. economy, to greater productivity. Might there not be a linkage between being able to also stimulate the Nigerian economy? One, it will have implications in terms of job creation uh, in both countries. Uh, where Africa is the last frontier, really, when, it, when it looking at development. So our rail lines need to be put in place. 
uh, electricity is almost nil. So if GEC here, General Electric here, United States, and um, other powerful uh, companies you have here that have a capacity in this area, looks at Nigeria. They will make money. So this is the kind of conversation we want to have. Um, take the issue of oil, which, quite frankly, and I wasn't joking when I said uh, the whole thing has been reduced to the level of you dig the oil, but well, we don't even know how to dig it. You dig the oil and uh, you count the money and give us. Now, that's not good enough in 2009. There's, we will we challenge U.S. companies that see Nigerian oil purely in terms of get the resource, put it in the, in the ship, and bring to America. Uh, to look at that maybe one of the ways of dealing with the Niger Delta challenge to the extent that that problem is, uh, is uh, fed by unemployment, is to improve the downstream sector, to see to it that about 30 products or so, uh, which I understand can uh, be refined out of crude oil, those 30 products begin to uh, be the legitimate focus of manufacturing activities in Nigeria. The companies will remain American companies. There's value added to the crude oil uh, uh, as a primary product. And uh, you export the, 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 the refined products everywhere to America and to other places in the world, whereas lots of jobs are created in, uh, in Nigeria. These are small. And then what, what will it take for these U.S. Um, oil companies to get into that? What, what kind of tax incentives do they require from the government? Um, of course, the issue of security is something that this government is already uh, very much uh, seized with. So we want this kind of specific discussion in the area of economy. Uh, if it's about uh, security, the reason why the African thing didn't quite take off was because of the lack of conceptual clarity as to what Africom is supposed to be all about. Otherwise, we can't quarrel with anything that can enhance our internal security in Nigeria to make sure uh, that um, the oil, which is still the mainstay of our economy, uh, flows uninterrupted. But what is the meaning of Africom? Uh, shown of all the ideological reservations about it, uh, there has always been military assistance to, to African militaries, from U.S. military. Um, can that be upgraded now into specific as to the training of our, our, our boys in the, in the Navy, um, equipment that are definitely superior to that that is being used by the militants? There, there, there is need, and let me be honest with you, to say that you don't always have to wait for us uh, to come with a comprehensive list of what we want. Because even the capacity to locate what we want is something that has to be acquired over time. You, the whole nature of partnership is that you, people can talk to each other in a very frank manner. And so you can come forward and, and say, based on your own priorities, this is what you think might be of of interest, and we'll look at it. At least there will be a conversation there. So that w what tends to happen, and I've been long enough in government to know that this, this is quite often the case. Maybe this is exchanged by presidents or heads of state, uh, ministers with all the glamour, all the uh, diplomatists that attend to these things, memoranda of understanding are signed, and after that nothing happens again. Uh, because now the ugly side of bureaucracy moves in. So you find a Nigerian government coming back 10 years uh, to Washington, a Nigerian government delegation, and it's about the same subject matter, the same conversation. Uh, nobody's asking question, what happened to the last discussion? So I think here we ought to hold each other accountable and say this is what has been agreed upon, this is what, who does what, when, and how. So in the issue of security, we can, 
we can look at, at that uh, that challenge and see what 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 what, what uh, uh, needs to be done. Because, however you look at um, the challenge of development in Nigeria, it's about state capacity. It's about creating the infrastructures, not only of security, but also of human capital that can make Nigeria a strong modern state. And so, uh, by being a strong modern state, we'll be able to continue to provide uh, leadership for global stability. In a world in which uh, the linkages are so intertwined and also so fragile, um, you, you can't afford to have a continent like Africa that uh, continues to be mired in one developmental crisis or the other. And some bad news coming out of Africa. We will have thought that this is the time for the mood of uh, what's happening in Washington. The, the story out of Africa should increasingly be one of good news. But what happened in Guinea-Conakry uh, is not just tragic, but it's also frightening. Because within six months, you have had similar situations in West Africa. Mauritania was already a problem. Uh, there was an attempted coup d'etat in Guinea-Bissau. There are some rumblings in one or two other African countries. Nigeria has been very, very firm in uh, saying that there are no good coup d'etats as against bad coup d'etats. Uh, there have been some newfangled uh, theory emerging from fairly surprising quarters about the need to engage uh, uh, new purveyors of this kind of <coughs> ideology. I call it a neo Praetorian hybris. Um, we have had all that before, right from 1966 in Nigeria when the same messianic uh, involvement brought in the first coup, coup makers. They always think they are the ones who can fix it and that we politicians are no good. But Nigeria is now in a very orthodox mood on these issues. And our position is that if there is problem of democracy uh, in any African country, the only solution is more democracy and that um, non-democratic intervention is something that has to be confronted head on. And we are ready to work alone on that issue, if need be. We were able to look at Mugabe in African Union, and we led the charge. And we told him to his face that the Zimbabwe that for which he was um, properly acknowledged in the days of fighting uh, colonialism. Apparently it's not the Zimbabwe, same Zimbabwe he's uh, bequeathing to his people now. And uh, we condemned the presidential runoff and said it was unacceptable because of uh, the way it was handled and the attempt to muscle opposition. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't win a uh, a popularity contest uh, on that issue. But thanks to Nigerian leadership on that matter, about 17 other African countries um, followed our lead. And at least in our presence, no African country spoke in favor of uh, what Mugabe was doing. Uh, we've taken the same position on Mauritania. The foreign minister of Mauritania, quote unquote, foreign minister of an illegal government, uh, wanted to have a meeting with me at an international conference. Uh, I said, no, we will not reward a coup d'etat with a meeting. Uh, but I received the opposition, uh, the kind of thing people are good at doing here in Washington. Um, we're also doing that in Nigeria, you know. I received the opposition, the leader of opposition to the Mauritanian government 
led by the Speaker <coughs> of the Parliament, who is opposed to the uh, junta. And in the case of Guinea Conakry, uh, we also were very strong in condemning the coup. And at meetings chaired by me, as Chairman of the Council of Ministers of ECOWAS, uh, preparatory to the meeting the following day, chaired by my President as the, as the Chairman of um, ECOWAS Heads of Heads Summit. We got uh, Guinea Conakry suspended. Um, we felt that they, there was need to be very united on that issue. And we, we are giving them not beyond the end of this year to return to constitutionality, um, failing which there will be consequences. But if the political will uh, in African democracies uh, is to remain muscular enough uh, to the point that we just don't end up with resolutions, uh, but that those who try to overthrow democratic governments uh, should not only be ostracized, uh, but it's not the kind of thing the world is ready for these days, but that there are consequences. Um, there's need for capacity to you know, uh, be able to carry out those consequences. I don't want to sound too militaristic here, but I look forward to a day when regional standby forces of, 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 um, of the continent, uh, which have already been approved by the African Union, but they don't have capacity. Uh, a lot of the challenges, whether in DRC or in other parts of the continent, that will have required a stronger African engagement, is because these standby forces uh, have not received the kind of support that we, we have it clearly indicated they should have from development partners like the United States. So apart from dealing with local conflicts as they arise, a, stand, a regional standby for, let's say ECOWAS, if ECOWAS <laughs> takes a decision about a country that has um, uh, returned to military rule, if we say we want that government, the ele duly elected government, to be restored to power within 48 hours. Um, looking at the profile of the regional standby force, it ought to be clear to the pushes that failure to return to constitutionality means that an African army can literally, physically, uh, move into such a country. What I'm talking about is not fairy tale. Um, former president of Nigeria, President Lusegun of Basanjo, uh, literally did just that. Uh, when the, um, the Prime Minister of um, uh, Sao Tome and Principe was his guest at um, a, a summit meeting in Abuja, and the soldiers announced that um, uh, the Prime Minister had been overthrown. And uh, President Obasanjo, well, it was a little bit easier because Sao Tome is just across, across our fence there. President Obasanjo took the Prime Minister, flew with him in the same aircraft, and um, I just literally told the soldiers to drop their weapons and, and have their, their man back. And, and that is what happened. Now, we, we think that um, even though that kind of model may not be easy to follow um, every day, and we've got Guinea Conakry right now is too far from Nigeria for this kind of intervention. If there is a regional standby force uh, and uh, the soldiers try their nonsense, they will know that um, they, they can be flushed out, uh, you know. So there are many aspects of these things that we believe can be the basis of a new us nigeria relationship. Now, finally, finally, uh, because this is supposed to be an interactive session, is um, that the United States should consider Nigeria a natural partner, a natural partner because we have shared uh, values commitment to democracy, to rule of law, to transparency. Um, natural partners, not just strategic, but natural partners because, again, uh, there are cultural dynamics that um, resonate in, uh, in both countries. Um, we believe there is need to also appreciate 
uh, the very positive side of my country, a situation in which the kind of stories that get out on uh, American TV, on media, and we are, again, we are, we are, we are sick and tired of being told that uh, because there's <coughs> government don't control these things, there's not anybody, anybody, there's not anybody can do it, but a lot can be done. But the image of the Nigerian uh, that is fed all the time on, on U.S. media in terms of uh, the negative perceptions of being on the wrong side of the law uh, does great disservice to our relationship. It is not the, the complete picture. Uh, most Nigerians are, are law-abiding. Uh, they are honest. You have many of them here in the United States doing great jobs as neurosurgeons, as community leaders, as uh, nurses, as engineers, as managers, as credit card uh, 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 entrepreneurs, and so on and so forth. And we believe that uh, one way of dealing with the negative uh, of the few, very small, uh, a country like Nigeria is entitled to have its fair share of criminals. Um, you know, once you are, you are that big, you have a few people who create problems. Uh, we, we, we don't defend that, but we don't want the, the, the negative impression of just a few criminals to tarnish the excellent work the vast majority are doing. So there is need, again, to locate those decent Nigerians who are contributing to the American economy, uh, who are adding value to your society. We know there are Nigerians, I've just talked of neurosurgeons, but even in NASA, we know there are Nigerians who work in NASA. So when next you see that spaceship uh, looking for the latest planets to, uh, uh, to locate, uh, it's possible that there's some Nigerian contribution to that. We want those kind of stories to be told. And if they are told, it goes to strengthen uh, the cultural links and, and the sense of, um, the, the sense that these are partners that can really uh, do business. And it is when that takes place that we will really begin to feel that uh, we have a more adult relationship. Once more, let me congratulate you for the epoch-making event of, um, of uh, Tuesday. Um, we have been very greatly honored to have been uh, witnesses uh, to history. And we believe that uh, that epoch-making event, uh, because of the transcendental and transforming nature of it, uh, gives one a greater sense of hope, not only of a more inclusive world, but also a world in which um, people are going to be judged in the words, the most words of Martin Luther King Jr. by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Nigeria, I'm going back to the same kind of thing I say we are tired of talking about, but then there's no way of running away from the fact that we are the largest population, black population in the world. We don't want a reward for our demography, but at the time we have the first African-American president of the most powerful country in the history of mankind. A country like Nigeria uh, is bound to feel a special sense of privilege and honor. And in the true African tradition, um, and even if you sound presumptuous to say so, uh, we can say as the continent of Obama's father, we guarantee his success because we are blessed him. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Minister, for, for that um, talk. I think uh, that was very encouraging, I think, to hear um, your willingness and kind of the need to, to 
create a dialogue that's strategic now into an, an, an adult relationship and focus on the specifics um, of the U.S.-Nigerian relationship. I think that's a very important message for Washington to hear. Um, I think your being here is a, a great opportunity, and I also hope um, that you'll keep coming back because I think it's very important um, to sustain the dialogue, to hear that message again and again, and to get into some of the specifics that you were referring to. So I hope uh, you will, you'll be a much more regular presence here in Washington, and of course, we're, um, and your embassy as well. I hope we can see much more of them uh, in the coming year. Uh, I'll open it up for questions. I, on, this, on the security aspect especially, um, uh, not that that should be the primary leg of our engagement, but um, that too is encouraging because I think there have been overtures from the United States uh, in terms of wanting to help on the Delta. Uh, and the, the Department of Defense, Department of State coming to Nigeria and saying, we want to help you in this. And the response, this, and I haven't been privy to these conversations, is often, here is the list of things that we want from you. We want, uh, and, and not necessarily a, a dialogue going on. So I think, um, I think there's growing recognition, as I said, that the, the Delta issue is becoming internationalized, um, and there is a need for international engagement on that, but not a, a clear sense of how the U.S. can engage constructively and, and whether there's a real dialogue going on between Nigeria and the rest of the world on that. So perhaps you can comment on how you see that going, but I'll also, and I brought my glasses today, open up the um, floor for uh, a couple of questions. Perhaps we'll take a, maybe three at a time and, and then come back to you. So we have the gentleman here. Uh, the microphone will come, and if you could identify yourself and your affiliation. I'm Leonard Oberlander, Consulting International Liaison. As uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, what you have said today is, is, very, is very positive. I would like to ask, in the, in this, in the context of development, diplomacy, and, uh, and security, uh, this is part of the international system. I, I would like to ask you, as, as Foreign Minister, what are the other factors that Nigeria and the United States, uh, in partnership, must uh, confront as opportunities for cooperation as well as competition with the other nations uh, in the development field, particularly energy, such as directly uh, Russian Federation and China, <laughs> Algeria, uh, Libya, and Iran, Venezuela, directly or indirectly. Uh, how, how does this positive uh, outlook uh, take into account the, co the, the, the cooperation and the competition of, of this uh, international system we're operating in? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Tim, over on the side. Tim Docking. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Tim Docking, uh, IBM. Picking up on your theme of uh, creating a, a period of adult relationships here, I wonder if you would apply that to the business community and foreign direct investment, and I would appreciate it um, at a time when IBM is considering it, increasing its presence in Nigeria, characterizing uh, uh, what you think might be a successful uh, sort of win-win adult relationship between uh, foreign direct investors and your government. Deirdre, over here. Uh, if you could wait for the mic, you can come around the front. Thank you. Um, Mr. Minister, I'd like to uh, refer my question to the very end of your discussion, where you talked about the tremendous capacity that exists in the Nigerian diaspora. Um, I understand that on February 21st, if I'm correct, you're going to be launching a database of Nigerians in the diaspora. I was wondering if you might want to explain the rationale for that to our group and how that group of tremendous, powerful individuals 
can be harnessed, perhaps in a partnership program with the United States, uh, uh, to address specific issues in Nigeria, which could include uh, the Niger Delta issue, with which uh, President Clinton uh, referred to a couple of weeks ago when he gave a talk in Nigeria saying that Nigeria will not meet its economic goals if it does not resolve the Niger Delta problem. Great. Well, that's a full plate there. Um, so, you want to... Thank you. Very instructive, uh, useful <laughs> questions. And I, I want to thank you all for that, for the interest. Uh, sure. Um, on, on the first one, uh, I like the way it was framed, cooperation and competition. And uh, some countries were mentioned within the context of the, of uh, the, the, that relationship. What 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 are additional uh, avenues for for, for co cooperation? Um, now, let, let me tell you the issue of oil. Again, speaking, maybe tongue in cheek, but I mean it. Um, oil has not really been a blessing to Nigeria. I think I'm saying the obvious. None of our great universities were built with the oil revenue. Ibadan, Soka, ABU, all those great institutions. They were built with money from non oil exports like cocoa, granite, palm oil, and so on and so forth. Um, we fought the Civil War without revenue from oil. But unfortunately for us, really the war was over, we ran into oil. But if we didn't run into oil when the war was uh, when the war ended, uh, the uh, creativity that went into prosecuting that war and, uh, and 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 handling it without borrowing money from outside, uh, I'm sure will have been available for us to transform a country which by 1970 uh, high, had a higher GDP than South Korea. And even more than Malaysia and, and Taiwan, we could have transformed that country to truly be um, one of the uh, 21st century modern social economies. But we can't keep looking back. We, we, uh, the problem was not the oil, which God gave us. Uh, the problem was the human beings who were managing the oil. And so we are not really very frightened about our oil reserves, um, about um, running out of oil, or indeed about uh, the emphasis now on clean energy and so on and so forth. Of course, we need to pay our bills, which are still heavily dependent on revenue from oil. So it would be reckless for me to, to stay here and say that uh, if our oil revenues did not come on stream, it's going to be, <coughs> it's going to be uh, very rosy for Nigeria because um, we, we are dangerously dependent on that oil revenue. But we are looking at the the, the crisis uh, that will definitely arise from the current global challenge, which is reducing the demand for well, at least the the oil prices falling almost every day. We, we are looking at it as a wake up call, as a as as a I know that's a crisis, but an opportunity to reinvent ourselves, go increasingly into the non-oil uh, sectors of our economy. And as I said earlier on, uh, before the results co completely run out, um, how do we now bring uh, add value and not just treat it as crude, which has to be uh, ex exported? So we, we want to work with countries that will that, that, that is interested in engaging us in not just looking at this oil as commodity, that primary commodity that has to be taken out, but, but in terms of value added. And that also includes um, clean energy because Nigeria, because of where it is uh, uh, situated, has tremendous capacity in the area of solar, uh, in the area of wind, and uh, we, 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 we want to work with um, companies in that direction because we have to worry at a time when a large population like Nigeria will run out of oil. How do we power our economy? How do we make sure that 
the other kind of capacity we have, particularly human capacity, uh, uh, as it goes into ICT, as we aggressively address the issue of tourism, how do we make sure that um, when the oil reserves are over, we are still able to do well there? So we, we, are, we, we, we are being a lot more strategic than may appear to be on the surface. But a dimension to your question, which maybe you may not have had in mind, but as, as I listen to you, um, that, that, um, that, 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 at, at an interpretational level, that, that got my, into my consciousness, which I want to share with you, especially since a number of the countries you mentioned also share one thing in, uh, uh, with Nigeria, with a large, large Muslim population. Um, we, we, we believe that America will find Nigeria a very useful partner in the dialogue of civilizations. The fact that, um, um, apart from Indonesia, which is the other country, maybe two other countries, we have the largest Muslim population in the world. And <coughs> with um, just a few hiccups here and there, we've managed to, we've managed to uh, have a considerable amount of religious harmony in which adherents of these two great historical religions uh, uh, live uh, uh, peacefully with one another. We, we, we believe that <coughs> as the world moves into uh, the kind of world President Obama again talked about uh, in his inaugural speech, a world of shared values. Um, and I again listened to the sermon of uh, the First Lady, congratulations, the women are doing very well in America. You may not agree with me, but that's my view. Uh, watching the National Prayer Service, um, we're told that the lady, is it Reverend Dr. Cynthia, is it Sharon, is it? the first woman to, to preach the sermon at the National Prayer Service. But we'll be having women in Nigeria preaching so many sermons long before now. But congratulations for coming to this stage. Well, she said something. She, in that sermon, she, she quoted a statement that uh, uh, was made by Muslim scholars um, about the kind of world uh, which we should be looking at, a world in which compassion, love, justice are the defining uh, issues. And he, she said there was common ground with, with Christendom on that. I found it interesting because here was a Christian uh, preacher relying on, on the spiritual authority of some of the things she was going to say and what Muslim scholars uh, were saying. You can be sure that kind of thing will resonate well in Indonesia, in Nigeria, in Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. Because we are used to that in Nigeria, having in one family you the man is a Muslim, the wife is a Christian, half of the children are Muslim, the other half are Christians. Uh, there's already a lot of dialogue which has been going on in uh, Nigeria on how these two faiths can be not a clash of civilizations, but a dialogue of civilization. And those few isolated elements uh, that believe that when they kill people, when they blow themselves up, they have 17 virgins waiting for them in heaven. Uh, it is quite clear that the angle they are pushing um, is not approved by the religion they are talking about. And um, I can assure you those kind of people are not likely to come from Nigeria because the brand of Islam we have in Nigeria is an Islam that is life affirmative. Uh, that believes that uh, <clears throat> God has created not only heaven, he has also created this world for us to enjoy in it. This is why Nigerians are very happy people. And I think we can export some of that happiness to America uh, uh, through the kind of interfaith success we have in Nigeria. Now, the, um, the, uh, my good friend from IBM talked about what about adult, adult uh, dialogue, adult relationship in the business area? The sanctity of contracts to us is key. And um, 
we, we put in place a framework that not only will encourage uh, investors like you to come to Nigeria, but to ensure three things. One is that the laws that allow you to take away all your profits if you wish to, uh, that those laws are respected and you don't even have to <laughs> ask any Nigerian to be a partner if you want to have it all to yourself. We are, we are, we are, we are welcome to that. Um, secondly, that um, the judicial system is adequately restructured and reformed uh, to bring about expeditious uh, resolution of, uh, of uh, conflicts. And then thirdly, uh, is the issue of infrastructure which uh, normally uh, tends to uh, increase the cost of doing business. Well, on that issue of infrastructure, we are making the point that uh, the very infrastructural challenge that makes doing business in Nigeria costly can also be seen as an opportunity for profit. Uh, because if you now come in as American businessmen to deal with those infrastructural challenges, you make far more money than you like to make um, elsewhere. Then on the issue of Nigeria and diaspora, I thank you, Madam, for the point you made. We consider our diaspora uh, in America to be one of our most important assets. It is our view that uh, the same way the success story in China, uh, in India, just to mention two countries, uh, started um, rising in profile because Chinese Americans uh, begin to look towards China, or Indian Americans begin to look towards India. Uh, we see a template, we see a script already tested and successful that is available for Nigerians. So in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there's a diaspora project. Uh, that diaspora project is uh, handling the issues you mentioned about database. We are not forcing our people who live in America to start heading back to Nigeria the following morning. No, but what we, we, we want to achieve at least three things. One, by knowing, by their knowing that we know they are here, we expect them to be even better ambassadors of Nigeria than they have been. We expect them to respect the laws of America, to know that if they run into trouble, uh, it has serious consequences for the image of Nigeria, including business opportunities for Nigerians. Uh, and so we want to celebrate them. Uh, celebrate their success and honor them. And by honoring them, you are also likely to honor them, to take more notice of them. Uh, secondly, it's true they remit a lot of money home. I think at the last count, something like seven billion U.S. dollars uh, annually went home from the diaspora. That's a lot of money. But often that money ends up uh, with cousins in the villages, uh, who refuse to work because the relations in America are sending money to them and they use it in drinking in uh, quite often or marrying a third or fourth wife. Um, they, I wouldn't want to mention which part of the country, uh, but I've heard about what is called Western Union Alliance um, in some places in Nigeria. The Western Union Alliance is a group of uh, people in Nigeria who have relations in America. And they look forward to the remittances from the relations in America every month. So towards the end of the month, it becomes a status thing. Um, you'll find somebody asking you, are you a member of Western Union Alliance? Because it's time to go to the nearest post office to collect the money which is uh, remitted from uh, America. And after they collect that money, some of them go back into, into drinking with it. Uh, some other activity that has no economic value to the country. What, what we want to do is that those, you know, Nigerians love families, and it's a good thing. But we want to encourage those Nigerians who are sending that kind of money to send it in a more structured manner. Perhaps the money should be used in buying stocks. Uh, the money could be used in investing in a hospital project in Abuja. 
uh, the money could be used in enable them to do other things which will enable them still meet with the needs of their relations uh, who are genuinely handicapped, not because of laziness, but because of lack of opportunities, and also create jobs and um, through microfinance and through opportunities. So it's a fairly advanced thing we are doing, and any help we can get from you on that would be welcome. Finally, on that issue of diaspora, that we think that having regard to <clears throat> the architecture of um, foreign, of ODA to, to, to call it like Nigeria, um, one sophisticated way of dealing with, with, with that uh, could, could well be to monetize uh, the kind of uh, potential in the relation between diaspora and, and Nigeria. Monetize it uh, in ways like it, 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 some, someone is, uh, say, I don't know why I keep coming back to this issue of neurosurgeon because in the National Hospital in Abuja we don't even have one single neurosurgeon and that is serious because it means that if somebody has a bad accident that needs just one hour window of intervention he's gone and that can happen to any one of us, it doesn't matter how powerful we are and yet we have got a number of them out here in the United States there's no reason why um, those kind of people cannot be encouraged to go home, not to settle, because you guys also will do everything to keep them here but you don't have too many, even American neurosurgeons anyway. Um, there's no reason why they cannot be encouraged to, to go home uh, and, and do their vacation in Nigeria. And the, the U.S. government can, can pay them some allowance for the period they are in Nigeria. The incentive there is that they are in Nigeria and they are being paid by the U.S. government to offer services for a month. You pay their airfare. You don't have to pay them what maybe... Uh, uh, Presbyterian Hospital in, uh, in uh, New York will pay them, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. But just some kind of incentive to say, rather than going to Honolulu uh, to spend your vacation or, or Bali, go home and provide services to folks at home. And we, the U.S. government, will pay you for, for doing what you would have liked to do anyway. Now, the effect of that is that you are now... Uh, creating value in our society by supporting the diaspora for an amount that is much less than what you will have sp spent anywhere uh, as, um, as um, aid or, or, or we don't like to use what aid these days, uh, whatever uh, kind of assistance you want to send to Nigeria. And who knows, after two or three of those kind of visits, uh, uh, this, this neurosurgeon may now begin to say, well, 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 America has been good to me. Um, even an American citizen, I could stay here for the rest of my life and die and be buried here. Uh, but the pull of home is quite strong. The challenges are more in Nigeria than in America. And therefore, I think I can go back home, spend the remaining five years of my active life in Nigeria. Uh, because the three or four occasions I went home on vacation, paid for by the U.S. government, I could see tremendous opportunities for America. This is the kind of creative uh, management of the diaspora asset that can, that can help in, in the direction of, um, of what we are talking about. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Yeah, Peter Lewis from SIZE. Um, Mr. Minister, uh, let's not be too quick to dismiss the uh, economic impact of drinking or gogoro and palm wine and Nigerian products. This could be a stimulus for the non-oil economy. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, it, I think it's fair to say that over the last several years, the uh, U.S.-Nigerian relationship has been downgraded, uh, certainly from Washington's side, if we look at the types and the levels of engagement and interaction and the commitment of resources. Uh, so there's a new administration in Washington. Uh, there was recently a Supreme Court decision which essentially delivered a second mandate to the Nigerian administration. And so uh, both sides know who they're going to be working with over the next several years. So the question simply is how to uh, upgrade the Nigerian-American relationship. Uh, what would you hope to see from Washington? What would you be prepared to, to offer or, or respond with? And what would be the probably most 
uh, productive points of contact to, to get that going. <coughs> Samuel Adeni Jones. Um, um, I wanted you to comment on Nigeria's position on the uh, formation of the United States of Africa. Uh, this issue has been hovering over the African Union previous to the OAU for a long time. It would seem as if there are three groups of countries. And the, the first group are the countries who think it's, it's a reality and it should happen now. A group that thinks it's a myth and should not even, they shouldn't even bother. And then there's a middle group which thinks that you should, you, it's achievable, but you should move quite slowly. Um, I would like to hear your, your comments about it and what the Nigeria's, Nigeria's position is. Um, Edwin Uden for from Intel and I'm also an engineer by profession. Uh, my question is on the uh, issue of culture, the linguistic aspect of it. Now we have a large uh, first generation of uh, Nigerians who have, who have inherited language speakers, like the Igbos, and there are many of them growing in limbs and bounds in this region. What is the Nigerian government doing to encourage the development of these written languages so that most of the states or local government or businesses that inquire about it, the Nigerian consulates or will be able to give them adequate information on how to promote this. And also this is going to be very, very important for the U.S. since uh, we talk about the Gulf of Guinea and most of the major languages spoken in that area is uh, this Igbo language I'm telling you about. I'm Herman Cohen, uh, a consultant and a teacher at SAIS. Uh Mr. Minister, you recall in Sierra Leone and Liberia when they had their conflict, uh, the international community came together to prohibit the trade in illegal diamonds, w which were used for arms purchases and what have you. Would you, would Nigeria be interested in having a similar arrangement to prevent the illegal trade in crude oil, which, as, as everyone knows, a, a significant amount is being stolen uh, from the Delta and possibly other countries in the region? Uh, uh, I wouldn't embarrass Peter by letting this audience know that Peter has been my old teacher, even though he's, sorry, he's much younger than I. <laughs> he's been my old teacher for over 20 years. He's even been to my village many times. He's very popular in my village, and uh, he, he eats all the local food in my place. He thinks all Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank Peter for uh, doing so much for Nigeria uh, over the years uh, to sustain them. Um, engagement at, at very important levels. Uh, Peter, we appreciate you a lot. Uh, the, the point he, uh, he has made is very important, the question is asked. And uh, again, I must acknowledge that for this very important uh, inst institute to, to give me opportunity to be here within a very short time, uh, it's part of your very busy schedule. It's all part of what Peter is talking about because uh, Nigerian Foreign Minister appearing before CSIS in a very epochal week, in a very, very historic moment in American history as this week has been. Uh, he sent the right kind of uh, uh, message uh, to all over the place, and I, I again want to thank you so much for, for that. Um, again, within this week, um, thanks to the efforts of friends from whom are here and maybe too shy to want to be called by name, um, I was able to meet with the uh, House Committee Chairman uh, on, on Foreign Relations, um, Brennan, that was yesterday. Um, also met with the, the Chairman of um, 
the African subcommittee of the, of the House Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, pain. There, there's so much, uh, the power of symbolism in relations between states is one that is too well known by everyone here that um, I, I need to <coughs> go into. I think that if we continue to be talking to each other, uh, in fact, not even wait until a foreign trip is made, we just pick up our phone uh, and say hi. Uh, we, we want to know whether what we discussed last week, uh, what progress is being made. Uh, that, that will go a long way. And I, I would like to see that kind of relationship uh, between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Nigeria um, and the State Department. Um, I, I, luckily for, for us, um, we, we don't want to be very personal about this. Um, Senator, now Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, is well known in Nigeria, thanks to uh, uh, the important role she and the husband played uh, when President Clinton was the president for eight years, and she's been to Nigeria a couple of times. So I believe I'm very optimistic that uh, indeed all of Africa, and more specifically Nigeria, uh, will will register very strongly in her in her radar. And I'm positive that in the next few weeks there will be certain strong movements in that direction that will vindicate uh, my position. We are really very ecstatic about her appointment, just as we're ecstatic, of course, about uh, President Obama's uh, election and uh, inauguration. But we, we want to see that this upgrading of relationship, uh, as Peter puts it, is more than symbolic. For instance, if we're on the same page on Zimbabwe, and I believe we're on the same page on Zimbabwe, not only for the position we took at the AU, but those of you who may have watched, I don't know whether BBC Hard Talk is shown here, who will have watched me on, on Hard Talk BBC barely three weeks ago on the issue of Zimbabwe, you know that Nigeria remains very muscular in engaging the crisis in Zimbabwe. Because if there's a meltdown there, which I hope will not get worse than it is, Nigeria will not fold its arms to the humanitarian tragedy um, that what uh, uh, that portends uh, that will be worse than what it is already now. We are about a thousand uh, three hundred people already died of cholera, and I know that um, when the Guinea Conakry thing uh, happened, there was a wringing of hands on the part of um, many African politicians, definitely there was a wringing of hands amongst my colleagues in the Council of Ministers when I chaired the meeting as to what could ECOWAS have done when you had the government of President Conte that was not only very corrupt, but also refused to leave uh, or conduct elections. So Africa is in a mood now for what I call preventive uh, diplomacy, whereby we hold each other accountable uh, NEPAD has been one powerful instrument, uh, the peer review mechanism thing, but one powerful instrument for holding each other accountable. Now, not all African countries have signed on to NEPAD. NEPAD. We want to bring pressure on the rest of African countries that haven't signed to sign on to that. There's also the Charter for Good Governance and, uh, uh, and uh, Democratic Elections. Just a handful of African countries have signed on to that. We think that, and I once mentioned this to uh, former Assistant Secretary of State, Jendai Fraser. I said, America gets more mileage out of Africa if it doesn't come out too frontally uh, and sound like it's detecting. You know, uh, we're very proud people even though we are very poor people. And sometimes some kind of pride can even be more, uh, <clears throat> a little more insistent if, if you are very poor. But that's all you have, <laughs> the pride. So we, we would prefer that on issues like Zimbabwe, 
you don't you don't fall into the trap of Mugabe by coming out too strong all the time to especially if you have not said anything about the land question we believe that if there's a collapse of the state in Zimbabwe it's Nigerian life that will be at stake because we will have no choice but to do what we did in Liberia and Sierra Leone therefore if you talk with us and we agree with you on a number of issues as to how to deal with the Mugabe matter. That raises the profile of the relationship. Uh, we, will not, we will not be doing it on your behalf. We are doing it because it's in Africa's interest to engage Zimbabwe and get results. So there's need for that regular discussion. But when there's that regular it doesn't take place, and the State Department maybe takes a position openly, frontally, that gives the impression that Africa cannot organize itself. And so creates a problem of ownership of the very policy which the U.S. wants to pursue, which we ourselves believe is a good policy, but because we have not been consulted, we are just hearing it uh, from, from, from Washington. The normal attitude uh, will be to either keep quiet or to, to resist. Uh, when I made my statement on behalf of my president at the AU summit, where I condemned Mugabe for what he was doing in America, in, in Zimbabwe, of course, um, his remark, uh, which was uh, intended to annoy, um, was that he knows that some of us are being talked to by, 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 by the Americans and the Britons, which was like suggesting that we were not acting purely out of our own volition. We are acting out a script written for us in Washington or in London. Uh, that was a laughable thing for him to say because um, I made it clear that Nigeria does not need any lecture from any country to be able to um, avoid uh, collapse of uh, societies in Africa. We were there in Congo 45 years ago when Congo was collapsing. Later on, we were in Liberia, we were in Sierra Leone. We were there before anybody else. We are there in Darfur now. We have the largest troop uh, concerning in Darfur. And um, Somalia is a challenge that we have been looking at. So if there is a failure, and it doesn't make up the policeman of Africa, but again by history, geography, demography, we, we feel we have to be our brother's keeper and that we cannot fold our arms if Africa is collapsed. So we want to have more direct. I'd like to, I'd like to have uh, Secretary of State uh, of the United States uh, put me on the phone and say, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, I, I, think, I think we agree on this. You know, it, it does help. I know the issue of DRC, for instance, um, Congo, when um, Foreign Secretary David Miliband called me and and discuss one or two things about that. I know how much easier it was for us to come to some um, uh, common approach. So if Africa is to play a very important role in the, in the, uh, in the foreign policy architecture of the Obama administration, um, and here we are not trying to um, seek for prestige, uh, the same way the U.S. Secretary of State will call his European counterpart, um, African foreign ministers uh, deserve no less, um, if only because we enjoy the dubious, uh, our continent enjoys the dubious distinction of providing the United Nations with 60% of, of the issues uh, that the UN Security Council is dealing with, 60% come out of Africa. So those of us who are foreign ministers in Africa deserve no less um, attention in direct discussion at the political level than uh, uh, most people parts of the world. Um, the, Dr. Denny Jones, thanks for your question. I'll be very brief there. Um, what is happening about the Council of the United States of Africa is not new. Um, it's just history repeating itself, and we hope we have learned the lessons of history so that we won't make the same mistakes. At the beginning of our organization of African Union, uh, you had people who, were, who wanted a union government immediately, the radicals like Kwame Nkrumah, Sekutura, and so on and so forth. 
and you had the realists like Prime Minister Tafua Balewa, Jomo Kenyatta, and so, so let's, we, we, you, you can't rush these things. Uh, Africa is just coming out of the uh, throes of colonialism. There's need to even build national consciousness first before you begin to look at uh, integration. Eventually, the realists uh, won the argument because uh, the opposition was far more rational. And uh, so the so-called Casablanca group, uh, which were the, the uh, radicals, and, and then the Monrovia group, the realists, they all came together and had uh, organization of African Union. Now, what is happening is that groups led by uh, the Libyan leader, uh, Gaddafi, um, uh, again, at it again, believing that just by declaring union government of Africa, uh, you, you have one. And um, we have told uh, the Libyan leader that he doesn't have parliaments he has to consult. Um, there are no uh, elections conducted every four years uh, on the part of the Libyan people to decide who their leader is. So Nigeria does not have that luxury of being able to take decision without parliaments. Uh, and our, we also have constitutions that make it clear um, that about where sovereignty resides. Therefore, to just announce a union government as I hear is being threatened at the forthcoming um, AU uh, meeting in uh, Addis Ababa the next two weeks is disruptive. Uh, <clears throat> might be very fascinating for a country like Libya that has the same amount of oil revenues with Nigeria that has 4 million people to bother about, whereas we have 140 million people to feed. But uh, we think that what to be more constructive for Africa uh, is for us to, first of all, see how is the regional integration thing working. Uh, in ECOWAS, for instance, uh, which is the West African sub-region. Uh, how well has the mobility of uh, goods and persons uh, succeeded? What about common currencies? You know, the one building block um, after the other. Europe with states that had uh, already been established for centuries and um, had a lot of experience on uh, modern infrastructures uh, still have difficulties in moving from the Treaty of Rome uh, to where Europe now to Treaty of Lisbon to, to be the kind of European Union. Uh, it is. You need you need to convince people. You need to you know. So, uh, what is my prediction? Uh, my prediction is that as it happened before um, in the days of the realists uh, uh, versus. Uh, the radicals. It's going to happen again. But we don't want this thing to end up in terms of camps. Those who are on the side of Nigeria and those who are on the side of, of uh, Libya. We believe that when we go to AU in the next few days, um, um, wise council uh, will, will prevail. What Africa needs is development. Not the grand illusion of a continental government um, <clears throat> that simply uh, raises new flags, uh, new buildings, uh, new protocol lists, and uh, the rituals of one ceremony after the other without impacting on, uh, on local needs. Finally, uh, Edwin's question on uh, uh, language, culture, and so on and so forth. I think it's important. Um, we are worried that the diaspora project may suffer difficulties if the diaspora we are talking about are just those who left Nigeria, came to America and had a good education and are working in America. If it does not include their children who cannot speak a word of Igbo or Yoruba or Hausa, then we are in trouble. If it does not include uh, their offspring, uh, whose names uh, used to be uh, Chukuma, but they are now called Chucks, uh, whose names used to be 
Ikechuku. Um, but they are now called Ike. Um, if that's what the diaspora is all about, then it will not move. Because if you tell those offspring to think Nigeria, they say, uh, what is Nigeria? Is it, you mean Algeria? Um, and uh, so language is key here. And anywhere government can identify with those who are trying to make sure that uh, Nigerian children in America at least have some smattering knowledge of the mother tongue, we will be quite happy to, yeah. Uh, our great friend, uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, asked about oil bunkering and blood oil. Thank you. I, I, it's a very important question. I'm happy I brought back to my attention. Yes, we will welcome any support in that direction. Actually, we made that request at the United Nations um, when I represented uh, my president. Uh, on the, the general debate. We also made that request when I met with the UN Secretary General um, twice, and uh, he pledged support of the UN. Um, I think where we are now is the technical issue of developing uh, the, the template of how the <coughs> uh, blood oil thing can be electronically monitored. I understand the technology exists, so something is being done on, on that and May I ask, uh, where, where within the government does that kind of strategy reside? Well, for the first, I've been talking with the Ministry of Petroleum uh, on that, and the committee has been set up to deal with it. Once we we are, we, we are clear as to what the mode of what we are looking at, of course, the international community uh, will be formally requested to to give. But uh, the political will is there. Prime Minister Brown is speaking very strongly in favour of it. The president of Germany, when he came on state visit, also spoke uh, in that direction. And the U.S. Secretary General is quite interested in it. We believe that the new U.S. administration will be able to give every, every support in this direction. We, um, thank you so much. We are out of time. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank the minister. Members of his delegation, and I neglected to mention uh, former Ambassador Dafo Fofawara and Ambassador Onubu. Um, thank you very much for being here with us. Mr. Minister, we hope this is the first of um, many more visits here when we can talk uh, in depth more about some of these issues that you brought up. And again, um, thank you, and um, we hope to see you in the future. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, long, be long before this job, Peter Lewis is my witness that Washington is my most favorite city. Oh, wow. Just call me and I'll run over. I'll come over. Thank you. <laughs>